Welcome to Architecture and Abortion, Designed of Political Politicized Spaces. I'm Mitra Memori, AIMA Chapter President, and I thank you for joining us today for a timely and important discussion. It was almost two months ago that the US Supreme Court officially reversed Roe versus Wade, declaring that the constitutional right to abortion in place for 50 years no longer exists. Needless to say, this was a monumental blow to the reproductive and healthcare rights of American women and the rights of all people. Justice Sotomayor, Kagan, and Breyer stated in their dissenting opinion, young women today will come of age with fewer rights than their mothers and grandmothers. With sorrow for this court, but more for the many millions of American women who have today lost the fundamental constitutional protection, we dissent, they wrote. Though really, from what a largely anticipated decision was, groups and individuals sprang into action to find ways to rectify this grave injustice. We also saw many businesses and corporations publicly and unapolog unapologetically assert their commitment to ensure the protection of reproductive rights for their employees. As a national organization, AIA is primarily involved in political or legal issues through our political action committee, Archie PAC, which contributes to candidates who support AIA's legislative agenda. Although reproductive rights are not specifically outlined in AIA's policy platform, it does include equitable and healthy communities, which the overturning of Roe versus Wade clearly impacts. Even before this uh, Scottish decision was at a federal level, abortion rights were being waged in the built environment. Texas's HB2 placed stringent regulations on abortion clinics, requiring them to meet ambulatory surgery center standards in what's known as a targeted regulation of abortion providers or TRAP law. Legislation specifically related to the physical building, equipment, and staffing requirements of a facility that performs abortions. With California pledging to be a sanctuary state and adopting measures to proactively protect abortion rights and access, including Assembly Bill 1666, which protects abortion providers and their patients that come from other states from civil actions in other states, the number of people seeking reproductive care in the state is estimated to increase from 46,000 to 1.4 million. Health clinics across California will need to expand capacity as people across the nation are looking to California to access the care they need. With this stark reality at the backdrop of our conversation, I'm very pleased to welcome our esteemed moderator, Ingalil Walros Ritter, FAIA, Vice President of ACLA and co principal as w, on, at W Road, Road uh, and Dean Emerita. Uh, welcome, Ingalil. Thank you so much, Mitra, and uh, welcome to everybody who's here and joining us for this in, uh, incredibly important discussion. Um, so uh, Mitra mentioned ACLA, and I just want to say a few words. I'm the vice president. This is a brand new uh, nonprofit offshoot of AIA in Los Angeles. Uh, the mission of ACLA is to be at the forefront of architecture education and community building, and to advocate for good design created by and for all people of Los Angeles. So let's, let's jump in. As Mitra mentioned, June 24th, 2022, the Supreme Court of the United States overturned Roe v. Wade. Following this ruling, a group of us from ACLA and members of several of AIA Los Angeles' committees, including JEDI, Women in Architecture, the Healthcare Committee, and SoCalNOMA, 
came together to ask, now what? There are a lot of voices in the profession who were telling us that this decision had nothing to do with architecture, and we disagreed. This decision directly impacts the health, safety, and welfare of residents of this country by limiting access to health care. Health care that is housed in spaces, many of which we design. But design of the built environment is more than the design of physical buildings. It's also defined by processes that determine laws and codes and policies and systems that determine the spaces we inhabit. These are the processes and systems in which architects should be more involved. So what can we do to act? I'd like to start with a few numbers. There are 72.7 million women of reproductive age in the United States. In California, there are 9.2 million women of reproductive age. 28% of these women in California, 28% were born outside of the United States. And 28% of them, the same percentage, have incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level in California. So let's make sure to remember who is being affected by these changes in these laws. As Mitra mentioned, California has for decades been at the forefront as a sanctuary state for abortion rights and has adopted measures to proactively protect rights of women and access, including Assembly Bill 1666. The number of people seeking reproductive care is estimated to increase from 46,000 to 1.4 million. And researchers estimate that California could see a nearly 3,000% increase in the number of people traveling to our state for care. So health clinics across California will need to expand capacity. And almost every week, there's an article about this in the Los Angeles Times and in our local newspapers. As people without access come to California for the care they, are ne they need. But there's more that we can do. In 2018, I had the very great pleasure as the director of the Wuha Gallery in Hollywood of hosting an exhibition titled, Now What? Advocacy, Activism, and Alliances in American Architecture Since 1968. The exhibition examined the little known history of architects and designers working to further the causes of civil rights, women's and LGBTQ movements of the past 50 years. It also celebrated the trailblazing work of curators Lori Brown, Andrea Merritt, Sarah Rafson, Roberta Washington, and LA liaison Nina Briggs. Two of the members of this fierce collective, Lori and Nina, join us today to help us understand what more we can do in the design of politicized spaces. So it's my very great honor and pleasure to introduce to you our two speakers tonight. Lori Brown, congratulations, Lori. She was just elevated this year. In fact, I think a month ago, you were there getting your medal uh, to the College of uh, Fellows. Architect, author, and professor at Syracuse University, Lori's work emerges from the belief that architecture can participate in and impact people's daily lives. Her work explores the social, political, and institutional arenas where architects are not typically present. She's author of the book, Contested Space, Abor Abortion Clinics, Women's Shelters and Hospitals, and the article, Private Choices, Public Spaces, Field Notes from Mississippi's Last Remaining Abortion Clinic. In fact, that image was the image that, uh, uh, for this event where she investigates how legislation affects politicized and securitized spaces. Lori is co-founder of Architects, a group dedicated to transforming the architecture profession for women. Her research focuses on architecture and social justice issues with particular emphasis on gender and its impact on spatial relationships. Lori will be joined in conversation by our very own Nina Briggs. Associate Professor, newly appointed Associate Professor, congratulations, Nina, at Cal Poly Pomona. Nina is an educator and designer and founding principal of The Fabric. She seeks to elevate and redefine design to positively affect inhabitants psychologically while solving spatial problems. Her interdisciplinary analysis of architecture and design in the context of culture draws from anthropology, 
psychology, and human geography, thinking beyond the traditional boundaries of space making. Through ethnographic research via cognitive and human behavioral mapping, Nina observes and analyzes the psychological responses to space, producing empirical data and theories, generating hypotheses that inform design more effectively and sensitively. As design becomes increasingly interdisciplinary, Nina explores how these shifts in paradigms transform design pedagogy and practice. So Lori is going to begin, kick us off tonight with her presentation. Nina will then join her in conversation. And at the end, there will be time for a Q&A. So we're only taking questions that are in the chat. And you can choose then to ask the questions live, or I will ask the questions for you. So it's very my very great pleasure to introduce to you here, uh, Lori. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Uh, where do we go? One second. Too many things open. Uh -oh. Hold on one second. What happened here? Wait. One second. Sorry. I'm having a little trouble here. There we go. Okay. All right. So I would like to thank all of you very much for the invitation to be in conversation with you tonight. Lori, I'm, I'm sorry. Honored. Sorry, we can see the notes. If oh, you... okay. Let, thank you. Didn't want um, us to see that. Then. No, don't want you to see <laughs> the notes. So I will just do this one instead. How's that? There you go. Perfect. All right. Great. Thanks. Okay. So I want to thank everyone who uh, was a part of the invitation to bring us together tonight. I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes uh, that will talk about the research I've been doing for almost two decades around and intersecting with reproductive health care access uh, in North America. So I initially came to this work because I was really quite frustrated with our profession and what I perceive as the lack of political engagement. And so I thought if I take on a topic that's inherently politicized, it will force myself and by extension, hopefully the discipline to start to have to engage with really politicized spaces. So that's what led me originally to think about the, the access to reproductive health care and abortion clinics more specifically. So that this work led to the uh, publication of um, the book, Contested Spaces, Abortion Clinics, Women's Shelters, and Hospitals. And the book seeks to make explicit political, cultural, and social influences where or can spatial agency be located and how can architectural thinking bring new insights into these subjects. So I also want to say that I have the privilege of being located in the academy. So I can take on highly charged subject matter. I'm not reliant on clients for sources of income. So I'm trying to use my space in the academy as one that can be somewhat of a, a risk taker in the sense that I'm not reliant, like I said, on clients. So I'm going to begin with a very short clip of, a, of, a, of the public space outside of a clinic in Louisville, Kentucky from 2012 to give you a sense of what some clinics are encountering almost on a daily basis. So what you're seeing is a, the sidewalk, a, a block long of protesters that line up um, and that patients and their friends and families will walk with them down the street because parking is not close to the clinic. And so those in the orange vest are the escorts, those, all the others are protesters who are there. So originally I was really interested in the right of protests and free speech in and around these spaces. 
Um, obviously, that is uh, an incredibly important and vital aspect of our of our constitution and of our right as citizens in this country. But I was interested in how this idea of a right has implications in the built environment in a lived experience. So there's there's the ideal of free speech, and then there's the practice of what happens as someone is exercising that right, as well as someone exercising what was their right to a federally guaranteed abortion. So as polarizing as ish, as this issue is in various parts of North America and around the world, it remains an interesting platform to think through complex relationships of space, a person's body, varying degrees of what was federal and now state control, the fluid and ever-shifting terrain of reproductive health care access, the potentials of design thinking and transforming spatial relationships, and ways to radically rethink and find agency within them. So part of this research was one looking at the national level, which I'm going to show you a few images of, but also looking at very restrictive states and interviewing providers and um, escorts across the country in independent clinics, because I wanted to better understand what were the issues on the ground that, that different clinics were experiencing and how were they spatially responding to these, often as you see in Louisville, this onslaught of people that can make delivering care incredibly challenging um, once the patient is actually able to enter into the front door. So the interviewing process, something I had not done before in a project, was incredibly important. It also allowed me to go visit clinics, to actually observe and see the spaces, their locations, and the context within which they are operating. So part of this research was began at the national level. So this is from the time of the book. So it's not accurate as of today, but it gives you a snapshot of where clinics, where access was located at the time of publication. So where you see gray zones are metropolitan areas with uh, populations of 50,000 more people where there are clinics. And then where you see white or the remainder, which is over 89% of counties across the United States that have no access to a reproductive health care provider. So um, part of, as was mentioned in the introduction, one of the ways that the, the built environment has been manipulated is what is called through trap laws. They're targeted regulations of abortion providers. So as you know, there are codes. There are codes for medical practice. There are codes that we have to adhere to as architects. And one of the things that distinguishes trap laws from other kinds of laws is that they are specifically targeted to the spaces of abortion providers. And they're holding these providers in these facilities at a higher rate um, of regulation than any other medical facilities across the country. So it became, um, and there's varying uh, degrees of this that we start to see uh, unfold across the country. So I'll give you a few examples. So one of the ways this research unfolded was, how can I make this information, which is incredibly textual, um, into a visual language that, become, that can become more accessible to the broader public? So for example, translating all of these trap laws into a visual icon, that then will get mapped across the country. So I want to highlight just a few to give you a sense for those of you who may not be aware. So for example, um, some states prohibit public facilities uh, to be used for abortion, for, to provide abortions. As was mentioned, some states were trying to change uh, medical facility codes to ambulatory building codes only for abortion providers. There's um, waiting periods, there's restrictions on whether insurance can cover um, the, the process. There are also unlawful laws on the books of husband consent, which harks back to a much earlier time, although you, it does beg to question given what's happening with the Supreme Court, if that's that long ago um, anymore. But having these icons created, mapping them across the US, so you could start to understand just visually that there is no state without some sort of restriction. I want to say that again, there is no state without some sort of restriction. Uh, some states, there are numerous, um, and, the, and it tends to track, of course, on the more restrictive uh, conservative state legislatures where there'll be more um, trap laws. So that gives you a sense of how these laws are beginning or have, begun, have been used to target uh, providers. So, I want to give you um, part of the research was really interested in how is space legislated 
that we as architects then have to respond to. So I'm going to highlight one example, which is a which became a Supreme Court decision from 2000, which is Colorado versus Hill. So in 1986, uh, the Boulder City Council passed what they called um, a buffer zone ordinance because there was a there's a clinic located in Boulder that was receiving so many protests that people could not get into the front door. So they created this fixed zone. So you see in the upper left uh, an outline around um, the building of 100 feet where protesters were unable to cross that 100 foot zone. And then they also instituted an eight foot what's called a bubble zone around people moving in and out of that 100 foot area so that a protester could only approach that person if the person allowed and agreed to, to have contact. So it was a way to ensure safety and more privacy as people were trying to get uh, into the building. Um, it began in 1986. Uh, it made its way through the court system because there were uh, challenges all the way through the Colorado State Court. It made its way, as I said, to the Supreme Court in 2000. The Supreme Court upheld this. So it's a demonstration of how literal dimensions around bodies and buildings become legal precedent. And there's a range of these that have happened over the decades, mostly in the 80s and early 90s. In addition to dimensions around buildings and bodies, there's also uh, other kinds of uh, uh, legislated codified spatial language. So there's been uh, other terms that have been created called no approach zones, the fixed zone that I just mentioned, the floating bubble zone, and then there's also been restrictions around noises. There's been exam there's been cases where the noise of the protesters were so loud that within the procedure rooms, more sedation would have to be provided so that procedures could happen. The noises would be so loud. So there started to be decibel level checks that would help prevent noises from escalating. And additionally, the the sizes of what they refer to as images observable on the sidewalks also started to be um, required to be of a smaller size because they became so large and unruly that you could not access the public realm in front of and around these clinics. So there's a series of these kind of spatial codified languages that are now embedded in our in our legal system. Um, so it begged the question, looking at as many of these cases, at what point does the right to physical access become equal to or greater than the right to someone to peaceably assemble and express their freedom of speech? Most often, I'm not a legal scholar, but from a layperson's view, uh, the courts seem to always side with free speech. Um, and so I was interested to see, are there other moments in our country, other times where free speech can be temporarily suspended? And I have found three. The first is around polling stations. You probably, I know we have our primaries next week, when you go to vote, there is a sign of this distance marker that has to be at every polling station that says within 100 feet on that day, there can be no political speech. So you don't want to be unduly pressured as you go to vote for your represent, re representatives. So here's one case where we as a country are willing to temporarily suspend free speech in order to vote. Another one, ironically or not, is around the Supreme Court building itself. So the Supreme Court justices have deemed that they don't, that you cannot protest anywhere on this, the actual block of the building, but you have to be across the streets on every side. And then the third example is around military funerals. Back in 2012, uh, the Supreme Court, there, there had been a case around military funerals where there had been protesters around, and in particular, gay military funerals. The Supreme Court upheld the right for these protesters. And in 2012, Obama signed into a law that uh, a, a requirement that protests <clears throat> could only happen um, that if the protesters stood, excuse me, um, 300 feet away, two hours before and after the funeral. That's a football field long. So. That's a pretty significant distance that was now um, in, led, created as a law. So those are three cases where free speech does not get free reign given the context within which it's operating. So it's something to think about when we think of when we consider the intensity of protests happening around clinics. So another part of this research was also interested in uh, what kind of 
examples of organizations or people exist that have used space creatively to provide care. And this would be pre-1973. So I want to provide you two examples. The first, which you may now have heard of, is called the Jane Collective. There's a recent documentary. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. They were a, a group of women in Chicago that started as a referral service. Uh, abortion was illegal, but women needed to find care. And so it began as this underground network that would uh, create a link with, with women to doctors. So they began to do this for a, a year or two. They found someone who they thought was a doctor that could provide abortions. Um, and then they started working with him. And lo and behold, he was not a doctor. And they just realized, well, if he can learn how to do this, we can too. So over the course of the three years they were in, in existence, they provided over 11,000 abortions uh, and no woman uh, was turned away if she could not uh, pay um, the kind of full price. And the thing that was so interesting to me about their, their structure is you call, you leave a message for Jane, Jane calls you back. There's an agreement on uh, how much it would cost, how much you could pay, and you were given a, a address. And the address was what was referred to as the front, and that's really the waiting room. And then where the procedure happens is referred to as the place. And women were ferried or driven from the front to the place um, at, the, at the time of the procedure. And this was a way to separate uh, both the people and uh, and the things that were happening so that in case that they were discovered, not everyone would be arrested. Um, they were in fact uh, leaked at one point, they were arrested and they never actually went to court because uh, in 73 Roe v. Wade was passed. And so they were, um, they, they, that went, that was just turned away afterwards. So the spatial dynamic of this, I found really interesting as a way to think creatively. It always happened in either houses or apartments. So the domestic realm becomes the space of empowerment where women are providing uh, care for other women. The other example I would like to highlight is Women on Waves. This organization began in 1999 by Dr. Rebecca Gommertz. And it's a very simple idea. It's a shipping container that gets attached to a boat and it sails to countries where abortion is illegal. Uh, the, the, uh, the medical facility space was designed by Atelier Van Lieshoot. Um, and they went, uh, and the way it operated was that they would dock 12 miles out in international waters. So they're under the Dutch flag, so Dutch law prevails, abortion's legal in, in the Netherlands. So they were operating with uh, that aspect. So they were always invited um, to a host country. And then because the women were then in international waters, there was no uh, breaking of the law by the women of these countries. They sailed to Ireland, Poland, Portugal, Spain, and Ecuador. They also established abortion hotlines. And at a certain point, Dr. Gomertz realized we don't need space and we can mail abortion pills to women in countries that can't access them. So this became the next phase <clears throat> in the work that she's been doing. And even more recently, in the last several years, she's been, or the organization has been dropping emergency contraceptions via drone across borders in predetermined locations. So it's an incredibly interesting and clever way to think about the way national borders, state identities are being transgressed for the, for the refuge and for women's rights. Another aspect when we start to think about how we make access more accessible is through vending machines. So this is not necessarily a new idea now, but at the time when I was re researching this book, this was not happening publicly very much. So Shippingsburg University in uh, Pennsylvania um, decided to provide emergency contraception at cost for their students because on the weekend they were informed that there were no pharmacies available and open where students get access uh, the pill. So they provided this service um, at, at, at charge. So it became a way that the health, the health uh, university health systems were providing care for their students. More recently, we have telemedicine in several states, in many states that this has been used, especially given the pandemic to provide um, the abortion pill. There are states who have outlawed, outlawed explicitly the use of telemedicine for providing abortion care. 
but there are this is a realm that has enhanced and there are discussions about how can we make this more robust now in our post-war uh, post-war wrote landscape i guess it is in some ways a war um sorry i want to get i want to give a, a case study of jackson mississippi so looking at the national level it required then that i start to look more directly at the most restrictive states and it happened at the time I mean, and remains true that Mississippi is a really good state to look at for the series of complications and challenges that women face in that state. So I'm going to start with a very short clip from a frontline episode from 2005 that's called The Last Abortion Clinic. So I had the, the honor to, to visit this clinic on a number of occasions. Um, sorry, like, skip me forward. Initially, it was this gray building. There would be protesters lined uh, up the sidewalk. Um, there was limited parking right uh, adjacent to the building. So patients would often have to park at the end of the block because someone had bought all the buildings on the street in order to make parking illegal because they want so badly to shut uh, this clinic down. The, there were people in the city that went to extraordinary lengths to try and make uh, her clinic close. Um, and they were not successful for a very long time. So in interviewing uh, both the owner and the director and the medical staff and the escorts, it became very clear that there was an opportunity here for an architectural intervention. You see that fence. Um, at a certain point, they started to create uh, some sort of um, with black plastic sheeting, uh, a separation so that it tried to become a bit more private. So I worked with them. We had um, a call for design ideas in order to create a more robust but aesthetically more pleasing uh, space in that zone to protect those uh, seeking care and those who work there. Overnight, at one point, Diane, the, the owner of the clinic, decided to paint the building bright pink. And this is more probably what you've seen in the press over the last several years. She wanted the community and, and actually the country to know that they weren't going anywhere. And obviously this is before June of this year. This it, clinic is located in a, what is now a, a, an arts district. So it, in isolation, the bright pink looks a bit jarring, but there's a series of pastel colored buildings. So it, it actually fits in rather well. Um, but she was really wanting this clinic to announce itself and to be proud that it was there and providing care for women. So in looking more specifically at states that were highly restrictive, it required to think about how does access work when there's one clinic? So it's located almost in the center of the state. If a woman or a person doesn't have a car, how do they get there? There's no public transportation system across the state. It's a series of buses. So looking at the time and cost to travel, looking at adjacent states, if there are clinics closer to women living on around these state lines, um, how would they be able to navigate the geography of access? It also required to look at rates of poverty. As was mentioned, um, women and those who are most affected are, are poor women of color. The Guttmacher Institute has noted and, and continues to document that poor women of color are seeking abortions at a higher rate, and that's for a variety of reasons. So poverty is really important to understand in, in this context. So it, Mississippi has an incredibly high rate of poverty. The center circles are individual rates of poverty, and then the larger gray circles are female head of households with children under five. So I'll just point out in Jackson, the female head of households, they, they are living around 53.5% of, of these women live below the poverty level. Um, if you go to Natchez, 75.1% of these women are living below the poverty level. So this is significant when you think about the cost of trying to access care um, another piece to this research was thinking about how can we expand it? If we can't increase the number of clinics, what if we think about um, hospitals? But before that, sorry, I, I forgot I included this. Um, I was also interested in the cultural context that these states are operating within. So 
being a part of the Bible Belt region, there's a, a significant number of religious institutions in Mississippi. There's actually, at the time of doing this research, there were 8,242 religious institutions across the state. In Jackson alone, there are 451. There's an incredible um, lack of separation between church and state in Mississippi. So I wanted to understand just what was that geography like in terms of the number of religious institutions. So back to the issue of hospitals. So the state at the time had 112 hospitals. If hospitals are required to provide the full spectrum of reproductive health care access, you go from a state with one clinic to a state with 113. I think it's also really important to note that um, not all hospitals provide this full spectrum of care. That, uh, in 2020, there was a national study done that 35.3% of counties had a high or dominant Catholic hospital market share that serves 38.7% of US women of reproductive age. And additionally, in 2016, 10 of the largest 25 healthcare systems in the country were Catholic sponsored and 46 were designated as sole community hospitals based on their remoteness from other medical centers. Almost half of these, 46% of all Catholic hospitals are in the Midwest. So that's another layer in terms of access. Catholic hospitals, um, most often, if ever, will per, will perform allow abortions to be performed. So you may have a hospital nearby, but if it's Catholicly run, run through the Catholic system, you will not be able to access that care. Another piece to this was thinking about the emergency contraception. So we, myself, and research assistants called all of the pharmacies in the in these most restrictive states, and in uh, Mississippi, there were 462 pharmacies. At the time we began this, so this, uh, this part began in 2007, um, you needed a prescription for emergency contraception if you were not 18 years of age or older. That's no longer the case, but that was one of the, the ways we were, when we were calling, we were asking. So we, we wanted to find out how easy was it to access emergency contraception. So we created a database and tried to track as, as we could the gender of the pharmacist and their response to whether we could access emergency contraception. What we found was that 66% of the male pharmacists would not stock emergency contraception and 55% of the female pharmacists would not stock emergency contraception. We also kept track of some of the comments, the offhanded comments we would receive when we were asking. Some, some told us no one working on staff will sell it today. Um, we stock it, but I won't dispense it. Uh, we, we flat out don't carry it. Um, or you need a prescription. We can't find the non-prescription kind. Well, that's because there's not a non-prescription kind. So there was some like erroneous information being shared. And we were speaking to the pharmacist when we were asking this information. So this information, that this data that we collected has been shared with the American Society for Emergency Contraception. Um, they keep track of this on a, in an ongoing way. So. You may have a, you may be near a pharmacy, but you may not be able to access emergency contraception the day you go. So I also want to, I want you to think about, and it was mentioned in terms of building codes, um, how can we as architects start to use our expertise and apply it in, in this way? So I have presented this material to a wide range of, of audiences. One was at Rutger, the Rutgers Law School, and I came across some lawyers who in Pennsylvania were trying to order, argue in front of the courts why these building codes, the changes that were trying to be happening from a medical facility to an ambulatory facility were not improving the safety of, of the space itself. So myself and research assistants started to study and make diagrams of some states, and I want to use Texas as an example. So you have to imagine um, or, or remember that our building codes, when you read them, they're pretty uh, challenging if you're not familiar with the terms or the language of architecture. So these lawyers were really needed assistance in helping them really um, analyze and, and be able to define what, what doesn't work here. So we made a series of very banal diagrams that they could use before the courts to show what these changes were being um, what these laws were asking the changes to be. Changes in door heights, door widths, corridor widths, um, operating room changing dimensions, the addition of water, water systems, addition of bathrooms, 
the addition sometimes of intense HVAC systems and even sprinkler systems. And so on paper, these seem a bit innocuous, but when you start to apply uh, a dollar amount to these changes, it forced over half the clinics in Texas to close when um, HB2 went into effect, when it rolled out in 2012 and 2013. So this was a way to help the lawyers present this material to the courts. I've also served as an expert witness to the ACLU and the Reproductive Freedom Project, further bringing these kinds of materials into conversation with state um, health um, organizations. Um, this was all overturned in 2018 with Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstad. The Supreme Court had, had decided that this is creating an undue burden when you try to force ambulatory requirements on facilities, that these are not necessary in any way to improve the safety um, of these spaces, that they were an undue burden. So I also want to just, I'm coming to the end of this, but I want to bring it into a bit more contemporary time with COVID. So we've had states who have tried to argue that abortion is not a medically necessary uh, procedure, the, the states that are listed here, um, and try to prevent women from accessing this care. It even was called out by the UN that this is a public health crisis for women in the, living in these states who can't access care during the pandemic. Even um, there's been issues that went before the Supreme Court and accessing emer uh, emergency, the abortion pill, and Sotomayor wrote a dissent, uh, making clear that it seems to be okay that patients during COVID could go and get an, and fill an opioid prescription without leaving their home, but they can't fill an um, abortion pill uh, prescription um, that they had to go to the doctor's office once or sometimes twice in certain states. And more recently, as was just um, mentioned in the introduction, with the Dobbs decision. So I want to just highlight a few pieces to this because I think it's really important um, that we're aware of what the dissent, the argument the dissent, the dissent dissenters are making. So bear with me for just one second. I've highlighted it, but I just want to read a few things. So they state from the start that at this moment, um, a woman has no right to speak of once uh, an egg is fertilized. And that in the Mississippi law that was at issue in the Dobbs case, um, under the majority's ruling, uh, a state's law, uh, another state law could do so at 10 weeks, five or three, and we've already seen this being played out. And states have already passed these kind of laws and more will follow. Some states have enacted laws extending to all forms of abortion procedures, including taking medication in one's own home. They also go on to say that the majority tries to hide the geographically expansive effects of their ruling. They say that, th that the cold comfort, of course, is the poor woman who cannot get the money to fly to a distant state for a procedure. Above, above all others, women lacking financial resources will suffer from de 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 ah, today's decision. In any event, interstate restrictions will also soon be, on, be in the offing. Some states may block a woman from traveling out of state to obtain an abortion, to even receiving abortion medication from out of state. They go on to say, one result of today's decision is certain, the curtailment of women's rights and their status as free and equal citizens. I wanna say that one more time. One result of today's decision is certain, the curtailment of women's rights and their sta status as free and equal citizens. And they, and they also state that because in 1868, the government could tell a pregnant woman in the event in, event in the first days of her pregnancy that she could do nothing but bear a child, it can make, it, it is once more imposed in that way. So this begs, this brings us to California and to other states that are now becoming sanctuary states. It's really important to think about the ways that your state is offering to provide uh, shelter for women uh, to provide care. So when we look at uh, where abortion is legal right now, um, we have this, what I think of as an archipelago across the United States. There's the West and the East Coast, Illinois, Colorado, and New Mexico. So myself and Jordan Kravitz from Phoenix, who I think is a, a part of the audience, created a call, a social, social media call, 
And we asked if you are an architect willing to be included in a list to assist abortion clinics in states where abortion remains legal, let us know. We are creating the spreadsheet. We want to connect providers with architects to help in anything they may need in terms of the built environment and enhancing their spaces. To date, we have 31 states and the District of Columbia represented in our spreadsheet. And this is purely from a social media call. We're in the process of creating a survey that we will send out to all the architects in the states of New Mexico, California, Colorado, and Oregon. So be on the lookout. It will be coming your way in the next month or so. Um, and we want to create a more extensive list in these states by trying to survey all the architects that we can in order to create the most robust uh, list to help providers who are going to need to make massive changes in their spaces to accommodate the 3,000% uh, increase that we, we are at, you're estimated to be receiving in California. So please let us know if you're interested in helping us. We need help in uh, aggregating these architecture databases to send out the surveys for. But this becomes one way in, in the short term to be able to help and respond to what is now a very sad state of affairs for healthcare uh, for women seeking abortions. So I will end it at that. And thank you. Thank you, Lori. Um, that's amazing. Your work is is very much appreciated and, and I'm honored to be here in discussion with you about it. Um, that Twitter call that you put out, um, the results are, are astonishing, astonishingly positive and encouraging so far. Um, what uh, I'm uh, concerned about is what do we do with that database um, after we get as many volunteers in the architectural profession as possible? Um, because uh, what we're really talking about is, is measures of surveillance, um, violations of, of citizens' privacy uh, and control over their bodies. Uh, and I think that um, Roe v. Wade being overturned is actually um, a great opportunity for those of us um, who are designers to kind of reevaluate um, where we stand. Uh, and I think there's an intersectional nature of uh, pregnant people seeking abortions. Um, women of color have the most abortions. Uh, the majority of women who abort are unmarried. The majority of women who abort are already mothers. Uh, and almost half of them have had more than one abortion. Uh, and most women who, are, who abort are educated, um, who have um, bachelor's and master's degrees, yet most women who abort are low income. <laughs> most women who abort identify as Christian. So there's this interesting um, intersectionality about those bodies who seek abortion. And um, that, brings me to, to think um, for which bodies do we care about? Which bodies do we care about protecting? Um, and this is an opportunity for designers um, to actually ask themselves um, how they want to exercise their rights as citizens, um, as experts on those things that are spatial because all of these restrictions um, affect uh, pregnant people in spatial ways, in economic ways, in, in uh, cultural ways, in social ways. Um, and it, it's actually violence, right? Um, we teach in design programs about public space as democratic space. I, I think um, uh, in a kind of uh, Pollyanna kind of way, uh, public space, um, has never been democratic, actually. Public space has always been a space of violence, uh, a space of executions, of shame, of, 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 of state-sanctioned uh, murder. And um, it's time for us to actually 
start thinking about um, what, how to define safe space, how to actually make public space and the thresholds leading to those private spaces safe for people like that. And how do you create safe space um, without creating hostile architecture? Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering um, what else you might think um, that could uh, mitigate the spatial dynamics around um, uh, reproductive care, care uh, architecture? And might that be a multidisciplinary design effort? Uh, might it involve not just architecture, but also interior design, landscape architecture, even um, urban planning? Um, do you, what do you think about that? I, I think you're, I mean, I agree with so many things, everything that you've said. And I think the issue absolutely that uh, public space is contested space. It's where our rights are, are fought and won. Um, and I think one thing I, I discovered in interviewing providers and doctors across the country is, you know, there's reasons why we have free standalone clinics that were because hospitals wouldn't allow abortions pre pre well the pre row row um so clinics at once row was passed became the space where they could have autonomy and provide a service but some of the doctors i interviewed had talked about they they also they had had clinics that were also in medical facilities in like almost a complex and one of the doctors in particular had said you know i actually prefer being located in this medical complex the sidewalk is hundreds of feet away and protesters are unable to to access the building uh -huh, uh -huh. and no one knows where anyone's going when you go into a multi-story building so she said there was something important about being a part of a broader system of care and that i'm not isolating myself she has other another she had other clinics that were isolated but she thought that the that what is serving her and feels more secure is within this larger complex she also and others had talked about the mainstreaming of abortion care as just another aspect of reproductive health care. Right. So I think there's something to be said about the way where and how um, is this care provided. If it is thought about as a regular part of um, uh, gynecological care, if it's thought about as primary care, I mean, there's other places and spaces where this can be provided. And I'm not saying we should not have standalone clinics, but I think how these clinics get created, um, it's very difficult for standalone clinics to find space to either rent or buy because people, owners automatically know or assume, sometimes erroneously, but not often, like what comes with an abortion facility in terms of the, the protest and could be the noise and, and the violence around it. So mm -hmm. I think, it speaks also to the interdisciplinarity of the care itself, as well as thinking about um, policy planning, definitely interiors as being able to create more robust spaces uh, for this kind of care as well. But I think it's become so atomized and ostracized, not like even not all medical schools provide training in abortion. So even down to the medical training itself, it's it's seen as this thing that some schools won't provide unless a student petitions to be educated in that way. So it's it, there's so many issues around how and where um, this care is allowed to happen. So I, th I think the interdisciplinarity, whether it's within how we think about locating these clinics within broader systems, as well as within smaller communities, has to be rethought um, because that could be a way to create a, a safer zone for for people providing and seeking this care. Right, actually making the the buffer zone uh, more building, right, and yeah. even yeah. even a, a building that um, is not necessarily a medical building, right. um, even if those are residential spaces or, or private spaces, but um, but the the reproductive clinic. Is is protected um, as this space within those other spaces. Yeah. And what do you think about 
um, you know, once you get a lot of response to your Twitter call yeah. and the 3000 percentage right. that's going to descend upon California and the other states where abortion is still legal, uh, don't you think that uh, architects can design more than buildings, but systems, systems, even if they are underground systems that provide transportation and uh, places to stay and, yes. and, and all of that. Do you see that as part of the designer citizen's job? Absolutely. I think I actually am going to be running a design studio this fall. Uh, it, looking at and thinking about exactly what you just mentioned in conjunction with uh, someone at Columbia and at City College, we're going to we're going to collaborate on this. Yes, there's going to be a whole series of infrastructural needs, um, housing, daycare, uh, um, transportation, parking, um, and whether this becomes overt or whether it becomes covert is a big question in terms of how much do we make this really visible and how much or 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 does it need to become and I, I i hesitate to say hidden because this should not be something people are ashamed of or or allowed to be ashamed of or shamed to be going to so i i am a bit concerned when there's discussion around making this a, like an overground railroad or or you know a uh, which has been referred to pre-row, there was a system called the Over Overground Railroad to help support women moving from state to state to get to um, an abortion provider. But I definitely think, and, and when we think about systems, we also have to think about legal systems it's, that affect spatial systems. So I think there's a real interplay between these two areas when we think about what, what, what could California look like if we think about how does a 3,000 percent increase get, um, uh, how do you meet that 3000 percent increase in need? What does that mean? How many more, like how, how do hospitals provide care? How do other clinics, how do other medical facilities, like what's the existing infrastructure there that could be enhanced and made more robust? And then what new things have to be created and built in support to en en enable 1.4 million women? People. Well, maybe, maybe that system starts with a mapping project, right? Yes, that, and we that are actually definitely gonna be, yes documents yeah, um, sure. where where the resources are and 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 how fresh they are, so to speak. Yes, but you, yeah. you know, I I, I just want to push back just slightly a little bit sure. about your comment about the overground or underground or hidden systems, yeah. um, because I don't we do have a history in this country of underground systems yeah. that were not about shame, they were about safety, right. about protection and about care. And, you know, there are or were um, a lot of networks um, I, uh, and digital networks, online networks that are now um, defunct, like the Uncle Network. You've, you've heard of the Uncle Network, right? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you mentioned the Jane Collective, but yeah. also, um, Carol Downer's um, yes, yeah, uh, menstrual uh, extraction yes, yes. Um, and um, I think that uh, you know just thinking about African American history yes, um, with so many systems and networks that kept us safe um, for us to exercise our social mobility, and and these uh, online networks are all defunct now. Um, because again, the surveillance, the privacy, yeah. the governmental um, uh, outreach is preventing people from from communicating. Um, right. And so maybe the underground network is not such a bad idea if it can be executed with care and and protection. But it, it's it's really important to me that we uh, remember for whom we are creating these networks. Um, and all the other logistical help um, that they need if they are coming to the sanctuary states. Um, and can we organize as citizens, because all these issues, issues are spatial, right? Yeah. Um, a woman coming from Mississippi um, who is educated, a woman of color, um, but uh, living below the po poverty line who already has children, 
how is she going to get to right. New, New Mexico or California um, taking time off from her job uh, right. because she's head of the household who is going to take care of her children? Right. You know, can we actually come together um, beyond thinking that design can solve all problems and actually mobilize ourselves right. um, to become a community of care? Right. Do, you, do you think that's possible? I, I have to think that's possible, Nina, or I can't keep going. <laughs> but I, I want to say one thing about your, and I, I really appreciate your comment about the Underground Railroad and how it created a, a, a safety network and a, a, a system to help um, enslaved escape. And I think the reason I'm hesitant to talk about these hidden systems, which I know will have to reemerge and have reemerged, is that the, one of the successes of the anti-abortion movement has to create such a shame and such a, um, that shaming has worked in so many ways. And so I, I, that's why I hesitate, is that it becomes a form of disempowerment that has worked for decades. And so, I and maybe I'm being naive to think that um, you know we we have we will not have to go back into these kind of hidden networks. But I think aspirationally, I want I would hope that we can create a system that is that is robust and um, embraces what it's doing in a way that has a public face. But I know there's an issue around safety. So there's a contradiction. I totally understand. Mm -hmm. But I, I do appreciate the comment you made. I also want to say around you asked what we are doing with the database. So that's a really important question. I don't know if you all saw um, in the last two days, I think uh, there was a mother and daughter in Nebraska that were found out through the leak of their Facebook account that yeah. the mother had assisted the daughter in, find, in accessing abortion and pills and they've mm -hmm. been arrested. Yeah. So the surveillance of data is real and it is being harnessed in ways that are incredibly powerful and detrimental. So our database has to remain private. We will not be sharing this. It will be on a secure server. We will be um, transferring information to providers in a secured network. We're really concerned about issues of safety and surveillance. So for that reason, and that was a critique early on and, and Twitter was like, so, you know, you can't just have this database floating around. Well, we're, we're not. We're very aware that security is, a, is, an, is of the utmost concern. So that's, you know, I'm, we're working with channels uh, in, of reproductive health care um, networks that we're connected with that are there helping spread their, their, the word through their networks. But this database will never be made public, right? And if maybe the database, that. maybe the database could be in concert with a, a kind of modernized green book, um, you know, as opposed hmm. to the underground right. railroad, right? Right. Uh, and the and the green book is is more an of approach an approach to the mapping of right. of of six of space safe spaces a necklace of safe yeah. spaces. Um, so that we already have that kind of analog model, right? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk a little bit more about the spatial dynamics of these contested spaces, and 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 how um, how the protests um, make people feel as they approach? enter exit those spaces and and mm. you know th that even if we are able to couch abortion clinics or reproductive health clinics in uh within other buildings um we can anticipate that there still will be um some kind of attack they won't be hidden for forever right, right. and um is, is there any way beyond the bubbles, um, architecturally or spatially, um, we can create safe space? Hmm. Safe space well, that has the, the psychological effect that you are protected. Right. So there are two immediate thoughts on this. One, when I went around the country and visiting independent providers, it was so apparent that 
almost all the clinics I visited really understood the value that space contributes to the experience. So almost none of them worked with a design professional. There was only one that worked with an interior designer that I visited, but they all understood intuitively or not that the space that that they're providing for their patients the quality of that space matters the light matters the colors matter the textures matter the flow within the clinics matter so it was really um illuminating that even though they you know they're not trained as architects they most of them had no spatial um spatial kind of expertise education. whatsoever uh -huh. or education but they understood that and so um can imagine if architects and interior designers actually work with with in 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 all of these projects how much even better they would become and landscape so, architects and as well. lands yes so the issue around the other part to that is so i've worked with um, the mississippi clinic earlier on and then a, a clinic in alabama to provide uh, a public interface that was a basic what one would call a fence but it was really a zone of protection that also had a landscape component, security component that would create a different interior once you get onto the side of the clinic than you know when you from when you enter and exit your car. So the whole pr like process, the processional of what that experience is like, is something we can bring to these spaces in a in a way that. Um, they just they they don't know how, they don't know how to do and that's fine that is what we can bring to this right. so those are two like obvious examples but i think the issue around security has to become um more embedded and more robust and that i did see that happen in in ways that were more you know you have to walk through a metal detector or you get wand down so there there's but there's ways that we as spatial thinkers can create a more integrated and holistic uh, experience for those coming through. But I do think, given the current climate, that that's going to have to be far more enhanced than anything I've seen um, when I was interviewing back in, um, you know, the 2010, 2008. And I mm -hmm. know, um, so I haven't visited a clinic uh, recently, so I don't know how they in that in that time frame have been changing and adapting but you know most of these are like regular medical spaces it's like going to a dentist or going to a dermatologist like they're not um these spaces don't require a lot of uh specificity med medically mm -hmm. um in, in the kind of general scheme of things so the role that we can play in terms of enhancing and creating these these spaces to feel more secure and to feel more um, uh, as a as a space of care, I think is incredibly important in what we bring to this. And then there's been others in our list um, so far who have expertise in working in government related, highly securitized sites. So I think that kind of expertise also is going to be in, important to think about in certain kinds of situations. Depend, you know, if it's a high higher urban space versus a rural space. Um, so the kind of ways that security and land and site uh, have to be considered um, is also a, a big piece to this. So I think and there's a kind of nuts and bolts, but then there's also the way that design can start to um, holistically bring these things together. And don't you think that the human escorts will always be necessary, no matter how much the spaces are softened? I do. Um, I, I like to think of it as human architecture. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Which is which is another way that um, we as citizens can yeah. can get involved, right? For sure. For sure. All right. Um, thank you, Lori. That was thank amazing. You, <laughs> thank you, Lori and Nina. Such an amazing conversation. Um, so. Now we would like to open it up for questions. I do have one question. When we met um, a week, couple of weeks ago uh, to discuss this town hall, one of one of our questions was: I, I saw a few comments in the chat. You know, the clinics don't work with architects. How how, how do we find clinics that need our services? Um, are they organized in the same way? I mean, probably. I mean, there's Planned Parenthood, of course, but can you tell us, do you know more about the 
organization of these clinics or are they atomized and you know independent so there are three kind of primary organizations there's planned parenthood as a co kind of collection collect collection across the country there's the national abortion federation and then there's the abortion care network and these are three different i mean they all know each other but those are the three kind of larger groups that people are uh, I'll say aligned with, but I, I don't mean it in such an atomized way. But the independent providers, so outside of Planned Parenthood, tend to have um, the abortion care network tends to be where they will reside. And then Planned Parenthood also um, has a pretty significant uh, I mean, infrastructure and has a series of architects that they may or may work with already. Um, but often, you know, people are not willing to make this publicly known for obvious reasons we understand. But I think the smaller, the, the more independent providers are where we probably could provide the most use um, because they are the majority of, of, of the providers who, who, are, who are the abortion providers in the country. And Planned Parenthood is a much smaller percentage, even though I know they're probably more nationally recognized. So those two, the NAF and um, Abortion Care Network would be the two, and we are connected uh, with them. And so that's who we're trying to work with in terms of our database. So thank you for that. Um, Ken, there was a question from you um, a, a while back, the information regarding Texas. Would you like to ask that or would you like me to ask that? I can ask. Um, Lori, thank you for doing this. I think I reached out to you on uh, on Instagram um, because mm. I put as soon as um, the the abortion as soon as the decision Hobbs came down, I put out a I put out a message on onto my feed that if anyone needed um, reduced fee for services, okay. um, that I would um, uh, gladly recommend or assist as as much as I can. Um, I've always cited Texas as, and I'm so glad you put up that one slide. Um, I've always used Texas as an example um, to young young design professionals who are interested in running for office um, as to the reason why they should actually get on their state building codes uh, committees and and try to get with ICC because yeah, it's glamorous to run for office and sure you can, maybe you get on, but the real change in this area needs to happen at the code level. Yeah. Um, and I guess I want to kind of tag on to the, the other question I ask is that this, this conversation is great when it talks about <clears throat> how we operate within the confines of state regulations. Um, but in the case, I've also made it I've also said it privately, and I'm going to say it publicly. If uh, the unimaginable happens, um, I've worked with other, other organizations when the ghost ship, um, uh, the, um, the disaster in um, the Bay Area, when um, the squatters were, uh, that fire happened. I worked with a group that was putting together a a, guy, a, a kind of a pamphlet for other um, organizations that were looking to kind of do the same kind of thing. And it wasn't really, um, a co it wasn't like, it was a way of trying to provide um, direction for people to do it safely without getting really tangibly um, involved. So it's kind of operating quasi, um, <laughs> quasi illegally. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm putting myself a little bit at risk in that area. Um, but I think the same thing could occur um, in this regard, where if, you know, obviously we want to make sure we provide safe and uh, safe access to services. But in the case that this does, you know, the, the trend is going this way, can you see putting together a pamphlet that will provide at least some marginal guidelines for healthcare providers who are looking to provide services irrespective of the state laws? Mm -hmm. um, because I think those services are obviously going to happen and we don't want them to happen the way they happened um, prior to 1973. Um, it, I kind of see that that's something that that tangibly can happen underground. Um, I wanted to get your take on that as well. I, yes, I mean, short answer, absolutely. I think um, 
we are very interested in doing something like that once we're able to survey um, the states where we know it's where there's a, a we we believe that it will remain legal like california and new mexico for example um you know one of the things i've been talking about with a few other people is you know doctors are now having to consider where they whether they put their license on the line right to do some of this work and i think architects are very much going to be in that same boat is how much like legally it's it's a big gray area gray zone right now we don't know what the laws are going to be or become in terms of interstate travel in terms of interstate um use you may be licensed in multiple states but you may reside in california so what does that mean if you provide these services in texas for your state licensure so i think you're absolutely right that we don't know um legally what the implications are if you do that and i think we have to go into the it go into this with the idea that we could be held accountable and we may lose our license that could be a, a, a what happens i don't know and there's so many questions that are yet to be un, un, answered from the legal profession in this way but i yes we we want to put together something that can be used i guess dare i say underground um that can be disseminated and and, and people can use and i really appreciate you your uh, publicly coming out and being willing to to put your name on the list and provide services so thank you and thank many of you because i know many of you here have, have also reached out so um, I've seen some wonderful comments here from Rosalie. Uh, would you like to ask a question, Rosalie? Talk. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you. This has been really, really amazing and informative. Um, your research is harrowing. Um, I also want to just comment that um, abortion care is also gender affirming care. For the trans community, um, important to note. Um, and then also, I have worked as a volunteer escort in my local at my local clinic, and it was really an interesting experience um, when it comes to entry. Our, our clinic was such that it was kind of set back and down a slope from the road, mm -hmm. and there's a median in the road that kind of confuses drivers, mm -hmm. and really the only way to enter is by car, there were a lot of folks coming in taxis as well, but um, there's not really, there wasn't a bus stop or anything like that near the clinic. So it was truly dangerous. So two questions, I guess. One is, um, did you get a chance to interview many escorts? Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what their feedback was and if you found anything particularly unique in their feedback. And then uh, the second question is, um, and you may have already covered this, um, but uh, city planning, um, just collaborating with city planners on, on these types of issues, on the clinic issues specifically. And also Nina, some of my background is in anthropology, so you're a star. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I absolutely inter always interview escorts if they're there because their, their observations are so critical and they provide insight that no one else can provide. And I'll give you a few examples. When I was working with the clinic um, in Alabama, uh, I and they wanted to, to speak with me too, but one of the things they brought up, so this clinic had bought two, two sites. There was a, a kind of lawn on one site that was undeveloped and then the building itself. And they wanted to expand parking and they wanted to create um, this fence that I mentioned. But the escorts had said, and they observed, that it gets super hot in the summer in Alabama and often there are children and their family members who have to wait in the cars for, for hours while the procedure day is happening. And they're like, can you please provide us a playground and a shaded space, maybe many shaded spaces with some water? Because what do these children have to do but wait in the car and they need some place to play? And I, I mean, I was so blown away by the thought like this is because they're out there with them for hours at a time and seeing and thinking about how could they make this experience better for those who are waiting for, for their family members inside. Um, also, I, I've hung out with the escorts on numerous occasions at the Jackson Clinic and had a, and they were really helpful in helping me understand the kind of practices that the protesters were doing 
how they were creating protective zones the best they could, the use of fans and noise to help mitigate no the, the protesters' voice. Um, so escorts have been really important in helping me understand what the what what's happening on the ground um, because they're out there often for hours at a time and are really the ones navigating sometimes these really dangerous people or who can be dangerous and and um, around their their patients. And then in terms of city planning, yes, we absolutely have to collaborate. And I'll use um, one example. So once again, with the Huntsville Clinic, one of the considerate concerns was um, there was a speed limit issue. And if we moved the entrance, you had to have a certain kind of uh, right of way uh, view because of the speed of the cars. So it was city planning and transportation that I had to actually go and meet with as a way to understand and had their approval on what we were designing as a proposal. So I operate far more as let's be transparent and get city officials on board so that they have an idea of what we're doing so there, there won't be any kind of unexpected hiccups, I'll say hiccups, uh, in the process of trying to get permitting. So city planners, um, and, and depending on where in the country you are, who knows they're, they're leaning in terms of how much they're gonna be willing to help you or, or navigate the politics of that particular location. But you're absolutely right that the planning department um, is a really important space for us to be engaging with in doing this kind of work because they often um, hold a lot of power and they can help or slow things down significantly in the process of permitting. And that's one of the things we were going to be well, encountered in the Alabama project for sure. Um, so I see a comment here that I would like to um, bring up in a, in a, in its Angela, um, they can't afford these designs. And that, you know, it's, I think the, I think that what Angela is saying is that, you know, the art, the fee of the architect is for many of these clinics probably not affordable, but it, it does beg a question. And I wonder, you know, I've been, um, you know, a lot of the work in our office is the ADU. And here in Los Angeles, you know, we have the pre-designed, you know, approved plans, for example. And I'm thinking about some of the comments, the conversation you and Nina had, you know, where Nina was asking the question, well, what are these, what are ways that we can design the, the clinic itself, the fencing, you know, the landscape right. to, to provide safe spaces, sanctuary spaces? Um, and is it possible to come up with a sort of, template that can be shared with clinics um, and is that a project that we might undertake um, nationally i'm just throwing it out there i don't know if there's any discussion about that nina laurie if you have any thoughts about that and i'm sorry I angela i just hijacked your question but i hope that's okay <laughs> it's, um, i went is, is that what you meant angela um, I mean, I, Laurie can better answer that question. I hesitate to um, to adhere to templates um, that can be, you know, used across the country. Um, just as you know, our practice does a lot of ADUs too, and um, as we know, um, those kind of cookie cutter plans, I, maybe they work in, in, in some kind of very simple situations, but I don't know. What do you think, Lori? Well, I think there's issues of, um, oh, I want to go back first to the question about, well, they can't afford what, what we're designing. Um, we have to work within constraints, and one of those constraints is financial. And granted, they are most often not always operating on a very narrow bandwidth financially, but they have to have work done. So how can we make it possible so that architects are part of that process? I think there's, sure, the, the kind of let's dream what this could be, and then there's how can we make it that they can afford it? So I want to argue as architects that we need to be able to design things they can afford that also enhance and respond to the conditions on the ground. Um, I, I just, I, ha I have to believe that, like that's a part of what we do and we need to be more, we need to be doing that more in this kind of space and spaces like this. 
that are highly contested and under a lot of pressure. In terms of a template, I think it's it's challenging to think about because so many of these spaces are often renovated spaces. They're not ground up construction almost ever. Um, so there's a lot of uh, differences from site to site and also from location to location. There could be potentially ways to think about certain kinds of conditions that are maybe a bit more typical than others. I know in the Huntsville, in the Alabama project, sorry, um, there was issues around height. And if you did a fence of a certain height, you wouldn't need to get a, a permit or of a certain material. But if it went higher than that, then you'd have to get a permit. So understanding what these codes are are really important uh, in order to be able to na navigate and, and provide more affordable options for the clinic. So I think it would be hard to have to create a template, but there may be a say a template of things to think about when you're approaching these projects um, to help move the move the process forward more quickly. And I do see in the comments that Deborah Richard, I think Jordan um, Kravitz was saying from Scripps Architecture has developed also Planned Parenthood may have may have some of those design something to think about. Um, I think we have time for one more question at 629. So we're coming here. Cath um, Catherine Hernandez, would you like to ask, are you still here? And would you like to ask your question? It's a good one. Well, the question was, is there an effort to work with grassroots organizations who are already leading this work historically? Of course. I mean, that's why we've reached out to the provider networks. Um, we're, we're there to assist. I, I don't think we're leading anything. We're there to work with them. Um, they know what they need. We're here to bring our design expertise to their use. So absolutely, we're, we seek to work with, with the grassroots efforts happening uh, in, all across the country. Emily Eisenberg was asking if your research graphics are available somewhere for further viewing. <laughs> um, I do think you can download some of the chapters on a Routledge site for my book. Uh, so please feel free. And if you want to reach out to me, also lbrown04 at syr.edu, and I'm happy to share some of them. They're also out of date. So that I've got a, in the fall, I'm going to update them. But thank you. <laughs> And, and Maura, just one more comment. Um, people not trained in design, especially non-architects, are frequently the most accomplished, insightful, and critical designers. This conversation about escorts and their observations of the space, I think that's a, a, a great observation. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so including them as part of the voice. Um, and then one final question, whether this uh, um, recording will be available. I think Kareen uh, was is going to be making this available AIA, is that correct? Um, yep, we just, all of us here have to be in agreement. That's all. Okay, yeah. so stay tuned. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Nazreen, how is funding generated for these sanctuary clinics shelters? That's such a great question. Um, that is such a, great a great question. question. And right now, I don't know, I, I, I do know, so, and this has been public, so I can I can say this. So we have connected so far um, three providers with architects in different states. One of them is moving because the, her state has uh, she can no longer practice in her state. She's going to be opening one in Minnesota. She fundraised online a million dollars to for this project, which is amazing. So some of this is self-funded. Some of it is um, sort of through fundraising and some of it is donation at this point. I have not heard of other kinds of efforts yet, but I would imagine they have to be underway given the, the severity of the need that's gonna happen in the sanctuary states uh, that are emerging. Maybe so I don't know enough about that yet to be able to speak more um, in, in more detail. Maybe you should reach out to, is her name Mackenzie Phillips? The um... Right, yes. <laughs> I, I actually had thought about that, yeah. <laughs> Really? Well, I, I want to no. <laughs> let us know. So thank you, Lori and Nina, for this amazing conversation. This is exactly what we were hoping for when we met all those um, weeks ago, uh, when we were crying 
raging, uh, drinking martinis, wondering what the hell is next. Um, but I think this was such a cathartic conversation, so constructive, so positive. Um, and I want to thank both of you so much from the bottom of my heart for such a wonderful conversation. So thank you for having thank us. You. It, it, thank you. Thank you for organizing honor. it. Well done. Yeah. Thank you for all for all of you who came. Such a wonderful audience. Thank you for the wonderful questions. And um, I, I hope, I mean, Mitra and I and working with the staff at AIA, if there's questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, connected to Lori and Nina, of course. And I think this is just a fierce collective of of of, of just talent and 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 heart. And this is exactly what we need in architecture. So thank you. I want to thank you all for this amazing conversation, and I hope this is the beginning of, uh, you know, conversations that we'll continue to have uh, to see how we can better contribute uh, to women's issues all around. Thank you so much.